This episode is sponsored by Honey Badger. Did you know that downtime can get really expensive? On average, small businesses lose about $427 per minute when their systems are down. And for medium-sized businesses, it can be as high as $9,000 a minute. That adds up fast. That's where Honey Badger comes in. It helps you stay ahead of issues by combining air tracking, performance monitoring, uptime monitoring, and more, all in one simple platform. That means you can fix problems faster and avoid costly downtime before it impacts your business. Best part? It's free to get started, and setup takes as little as 5 minutes. So if you haven't already, bookmark HoneyBadger.io, that's HoneyBadger.io, and keep your business running smoothly. In this episode, we're going to have a pretty interesting look at something. I have a GPU farm, and it is load balanced with HA proxy, and the back end is using Olama. So I'm using this with large language models. And basically, we can make requests that's going to go to the main endpoint of this, and it's going to be making requests to each one of the servers in a load balance round robin fashion. But there is kind of a problem with this because I have limited resources on this environment. And when this infrastructure becomes overloaded, meaning that there are too many requests queued up because they all do happen in background jobs, then these servers with the GPUs can become overloaded. So I do have a specific queue that I have set up for these where we basically have our user requests coming in from the internet and it comes into my firewall. And once it comes through, it's going to go to a load balancer, and that load balancer is going to send it off to one of the many different GPU servers that I have. So I'll just annotate all of these GPU servers. But the reality is, this isn't quite showing the full picture. Because when the request comes in from the cloud, that is happening as we explained, and it does come through the firewall. But before it hits the load balancer, the request actually comes down to the application server. The application server then sees that it needs to make a request out to the GPU load balancer. And so we'll call this our background job. And that background job then sends it up to the load balancer. So this is a much more accurate description of what's happening. So this load balancer is behind the firewall, so it's not publicly accessible. And this works really well. However, there is quite a problem with this method because if this trunk or basically the number of queues that I have set up for the load balancer is overburdened, meaning that there is jobs processing on all of these, then the end user may have to wait for a response. And that's less than ideal. So what I want to do in this episode is to remove that link from the load balancer, and instead, we're going to do a conditional. And this conditional is basically going to check if the queue is full. And if this queue is full, then we're going to make an external request where it's able to then perform the same calculations that it would on the GPUs. But if the queue is not full, then it will go up to my load balancer. And so by doing this, I'm able to use the resources that I have first. But if they become overburdened, then I'm able to fall back to a cloud service, which is much larger in scale, but it's also metered billing. And so it's really a decision that had to be made where if I went with just the cloud, then I would have to rethink how I'm charging on the front end to the end users. Because doing metered billing isn't a horrible thing, but it is when you have a static monthly charge that you're charging the end users. And so ideally, we would never hit this point where the queue is full and it's hitting the metered billing. However, if it is full, meaning that the resources attached to the load balancer are all working on different jobs, then we don't want the end user to have to wait. So it's kind of taking a hybrid approach, and that's what we're going to look at in this episode, is creating this conditional logic if the queue is full, if it's not, then proceeding in one route, and if it is, then proceeding in a different route. To get started, there will be some setup that we need to do. For example, I want to use solid queue as my background job. So I'm going to copy over the solid queue settings up into my development. That does mean that we'll have a primary database as well as the queue database. However, this methodology should work with other background workers like Psychic or Good Job. But because solid queue does come with Rails 8, 
that is what we'll focus on. And for the purpose of this, I'm also going to increase the pull size because I am going to just load up Solid Q within Puma so there will be additional connections to the database being open. We can then come into the environments and in the development.rb, we don't have anything set up for our background processor. So I am just going to copy that from the production RB where we're basically going to set our Q adapter to solid Q and then the connects to will connect to the Q database available for writing. And so I'm just going to paste that into our development.rb so we can also use solid Q within the development environment. And so next, let's just try to piece this together from the front end. So on our welcome page, we're just going to have something where we just make a request back to back to this page. So we'll have a link to, and we'll just say Q one job. And then we'll also have another one that says Q 10 jobs. And so we're just going to take this back to our root path and we're just going to set a jobs and we'll do a one and we'll set the next one to a jobs of 10. And because this is a Rails 8 application and I'm making a get request here, I don't want to just hover over this link and then it automatically make that request. Instead, I want the person to have to click on it. So just keep that in mind that using get requests on things that are going to be mutating in the background, you really don't want to do. I'm going to disable the prefetch with the data turbo prefetch and we'll set that equal to false. So that way, when you hover over the link, it's not going to automatically do that. You had to click on the link in order for that request to be made. And then in the welcome index, I'm just going to do a check if the params and the jobs exist then we'll do something. In this case, we just want to take the params jobs. Let's convert it over to an integer and then we'll do a times just to iterate over however many times. And for now, we could just do a rails.logger.info and then we can put in some kind of emoji and let's just say we'll have log executed. And so if we were to run our Rails application, we'll first prepare our database and then we'll run our application with the bin dev as we make a request, you'll see that we got our log executed with the prems job of one. And if we were to queue it up 10 times, we got 10 executions. So basically what we want to do is now put this over into a background job. So I'm going to generate a job and we'll just call this some expensive background job. Within this job, you will have some kind of record or attributes that you're passing in. And then we can basically take what we are doing within the controller we can throw that into the background job and maybe we want to puts out what that sum record is. We can call this job perform later and then we can just pass in some random number. And so that's really the basics of the setup that we need for this. So the background job is then going to execute this however many times. And there is some fallacy with this that we will discuss soon. But if we just queue up one job, we can scroll up. We see that this job executed successfully. And if we queue up 10 jobs, it's going to queue up and execute all the 10 jobs just as we would expect. But right now, this is all getting queued as default, but that's not exactly what we want. We want this to be queued up depending on something else. And so you do need to be a bit careful here because how you're going to match that queue number does need to correlate to what you're doing in your actual queue. So basically what that means is if we have one queue, that's going to be handling default. We can create another queue that's going to be for our GPU job. And then we want another queue that's going to be handling our GPU external jobs. So right now we have three threads on this GPU job, which means that three is our magic number that we're going to have to keep in mind as we are setting this up. So what you could do is create a block on this queue as and then we need to see something like, a, is the GPU queue full? If it is, then we need to send our work over to the GPU external. Otherwise, we can use our normal internal GPU queue. So if this queue is full, which is a method that we'll have to make, we could create it within this expensive background job, but I'm gonna actually put it up in the application job because this could be useful in multiple jobs. So I wanna keep it rather flexible. And so kind of the magic that we're going to do here, and this is specific to solid queue. So if you are using a different background worker, you will need to make sure that you modify this appropriately. We can get from the solid queue, the claimed execution 
we want to join with the job, and then we can search where the solid Q jobs and where the Q name is set to GPU. We can then just return a count. So now we can check if the active underscore jobs is greater than or equal to, and then we had to put in our magic number. And so before we go further, I hate having magic numbers because if I come in here and look at this, I have no idea why number three is set. And so to me, this is a big problem because now I have to remember to come into here in this file as well as the queue if this number ever needs to change. So instead, what I want to do is to have some kind of global variable. So I'm just going to set a GPU queue size and I'm going to create a initializer. You can name it whatever you want. It doesn't really matter because all we're going to have in here is the GPU queue size is set to three. So now in our queue, instead of setting this magic number to three, we can now just use ERB tags to set the GPU queue size. In our job, we're using that GPU queue size. And now within our jobs, we can use this GPU queue full. So in this background job, we can then basically set if the queue name is equal to GPU, then we can do one thing otherwise, or if you want to do an else if, the Q name is equal to the GPU external, then we can do something different. And I'm just going to change what we are logging out to GPU and GPU external, just so we're able to see it, make the switch in our logs. But before we test this out, it's really important to know that when we are talking about this claimed execution, these are jobs that are actively being queued up. So in our example of queuing up 10 jobs, that's not actually going to work. And so we can test this out. I'll go ahead and run bin dev. But before I run bin dev, I actually want to grep out just that emoji because I don't need all of the noise that's going on. And so to test this out, we can queue up one job. We saw a guy executed by the GPU and I just queued up three of them. If we now queue up 10 jobs, you'll see that because these executed so fast, some of them got thrown into the GPU queue, but they were able to execute really fast. But then the other ones, got moved over to the GPU external. So typically when we're doing this, we're going to have a much larger delay. So let's just add a sleep of two seconds on here. And let's see what happens now. We'll queue up one job that gets executed, but let's queue up a bunch of them right now. And you see that after the three, then they get queued up to the GPU external. Let's clear out the terminal and try this again with queuing up 10 jobs. We'll queue up the 10 jobs, but you'll see that it never got actually queued up to the external GPU. That's because these all got queued up to the GPU jobs way too fast. But I think in a normal workload, that should be okay. But if it's not, then you may need to tweak it around to find what works best for you. But again, if we just queue up many of the jobs, just as we would expect, kind of normal behavior, now you'll see that it's bouncing between the GPU queue and the external one because it's actively working on the jobs. And so this works out pretty good. However, there is something that I don't like about this because if I put in all of the logic within here, then this could get kind of messy. So instead, I'm going to create another directory under the app models, and I'm just going to call it GPUs. Now, I want to touch a few different files. We're going to have a base file because there's going to be a lot of shared logic, but then we can create other Ruby classes. One I'll just call the processor, and the other one I'll call the external underscore processor dot RB. And the reason why I like doing this is because all of this logic that is happening, it's too much for one file, especially when we are mixing in requests that's going to be communicating with an API and other stuff. So instead, I want to move this logic into the GPU's processor, and we'll just execute, passing in that sum record. We're gonna do something very similar for the GPU external, where we're just taking that logic, and then we'll call the external processor. And our processor is gonna be a class of the GPU's processor, and we're going to inherit from the GPU's and the base class. I don't really have anything to put into that base class, simply because, we're not going to actually be making API requests, but I would recommend putting any of the shared logic that you could into that base class 
because now we're inheriting from it. But we do need the execute method. We made it a class method. We'll take in our sum record, and then we can paste our code in there. Within the external processor, it's going to be something very similar, but we'll just make this for the external processor, and that looks good. I actually want to make this where we can see when it finishes. So I'm going to use a different emoji. We'll just use a flag, and I'll do the same for this. And then we also need to set up our base class with the GPUs, base, and we'll just leave it empty. But again, move as much logic as you can into here. So basically, the processor and the external processor classes will really just have the difference in how you communicate with the API. And so let's test this out now. I do have our GPU queue and the GPU external queue. The queue size, we have three for our GPU, and I've bumped up the GPU external to 15, just so we can handle some additional load. And so I want to run our application, but now I want to grep in, and I want to check not only for the check mark, but we could also pipe in and check for the flag as well, just so we can see when they start and finish. So I'm going to come back, we'll queue up one job, and it hit the GPU queue, just as we would expect. So now I'm going to queue up five different jobs. One, two, three, four, five. And you see that two of the jobs went to the GPU external queue because the GPU queue was saturated. Those have all completed now. So let's go ahead and queue up 10 jobs. And now you'll see that I queued up three jobs to the GPU queue and the rest got funneled over into the GPU external. However, one job also got snuck into the GPU queue. And essentially what's happening there is because of the application job where we have the claimed execution. And that's a bit of a race condition and that may be acceptable in your use case, or you may need to tweak this a bit more. But in reality, you're probably not going to have 10 concurrent jobs coming in at the exact same time. Instead, you're probably going to have them flood in and there would be a bit of a delay. So I'm going to queue up 10 jobs just on the one job queue. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, And those are all getting queued up to the GPU external, except for the first three, which got queued up. But then if I queue up some additional ones where it's now going back to the normal GPU queue, because that queue has been freed up. Once all the jobs are done, it'll then queue up to the GPU queue. And ideally, you would only ever be using your GPU queue unless if it was full and then it'll bounce the request to the GPU external. And so this idea of using the GPU queue full to specify a different queue for the background job, depending on the condition, can be very powerful. You obviously want to make sure that whatever check this is doing, it is pretty quick, because if this is a very heavy calculation, then you could just be adding a lot of latency unnecessarily. But it's also kind of cool because this isn't just for things like a GPU. If you had situations where it was cheaper to get two different plans from two different companies on the smaller plans than one plan that was medium size from one company, so this could be SMS, emails, or anything else, then your two plans, you could bounce between the two different queues depending on some other situation. And it can also handle certain situations where maybe certain API keys that you have are rate limited. So maybe you can only make one or two concurrent requests at a time to a service, but they freely give you additional API keys that can also be used one or two requests at a time. So there's a lot of options and a lot of different things that you can do. Just make sure that you do stay within the end user license agreements and have a lot of fun with this kind of stuff. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.